Now that I've given you an overview of what Spring Boot is and talked a little bit about some of the patterns that it implements, let's take a more detailed tour into its internal architecture. And I'm not going to look at the internal source code. I'm just going to give you an overview of its structure and talk about some of the key internal components. And these are all quite fascinating, especially if you are interested in seeing how stuff works under the hood. And the architecture we're about to look at is actually quite similar for both Web MVC and Web Flux. There are definitely behavioral differences in some places, but the way in which requests come into the system and the way in which they're processed is very similar. OK, so let's start off by talking about this. Internally, Spring Boot leverages something called servlets and HTTP request and response processing. And a, a servlet is a technology that's been around for a very, very, very long time in the context of Java. And it, it goes way back probably to the middle to late 90s, where people wanted to write little pieces of code that would take requests coming in from clients and then turn those HTTP requests into something that could be handled by objects. And the word servlet was kind of a pun on the word applet. And applet was kind of the other thing. They aren't used much anymore. But back in the day, back in the mid-90s, there was this way of downloading code into, from a server into your Java client. And then the code in the Java client could do interesting things. It could do computation. It could do data processing. It could do visualizations and display and so on. For various reasons, applets fell out of favor because it was also a way to download viruses into your computer, uh, which was not a good idea. But uh, servlets lived on. So servlets and applets, they're just trying to say they're the little things that do stuff. OK, so let's take a look at some of the pieces. The client, remember the client here could be a browser. It could be a mobile app running natively. It could be a standalone application. Not that anybody built a lot of these anymore. Uh, Microsoft Word, traditional Microsoft Word would be an example, something like that. It could be a command line, console-based app, whatever. It sends HTTP requests. And these requests are very well known, get requests, post requests, delete requests, update requests, and so on. And we'll talk a bit more about some of the key ones, get and post, especially get initially. So they send requests just using the good old HTTP protocol, which underneath the hood uses TCP IP. And that sends the request over to something called the dispatcher servlet. And the dispatcher servlet is this infrastructure piece that takes the incoming HTTP request, get put, or get post, put, um, delete, and so on. And it goes ahead and converts it into an internal data structure that it knows about. And that data structure is then forwarded to a handler. And you can see here that there's various little links at the bottom of the slides that talk about this stuff if you want to learn more about each of these different steps. So we get this handler. And this handler then takes a look at the data structure it got, which contains the contents of the request. And it figures out which controller handles that request. Because you will have registered a controller. You will have written a controller. And it will automatically register using the inversion of control model we talked about before. It will have registered with the Spring framework. And that's where the request is going to be sent. And the controller is then responsible for taking the contents of the request, which, as you can imagine, are typically in string format because they're going across the network. And maybe there's some JSON inv involved as well, depending on how you're doing this. And it then goes ahead, and the controller, without your intervention, in other words, it's, it's eliminating all the distracting bits we talked about before, it's going to end up converting that request into a method call on the controller object that you wrote. And we'll see how you do that shortly. And then that, that method call typically doesn't do much beyond just forward to the underlying service that implements the business logic. And we use the word business logic loosely. It doesn't have to be a business application. It's whatever you're doing that's specific to that particular application. So this controller, which is typically called a REST controller, forwards the request which is now in method and na native Java type system format into the service and or the model. And typically, the service is the traffic cop that will then make the right calls to the model to get the data if it's persistent. When that's done, the service method returns. That returns back to the controller method that forwarded it to it. That method then 
the, the controller method, when it returns, will then go ahead and convert the response to the HTTP response format, which again is going to be encoded typically with strings and JSON and so on and so forth. And so that information is sent back here to the dispatcher servlet. And then the dispatcher servlet takes all this information it got back from the controller and it converts the response to an HTTP response. And then that is going to be returned back to the client. And so the client will then take whatever came back and, and usually the client is using the proxy pattern. And so in that case, what the client application sees will again be, if you're using Java, native Java types, like a list of integers or a map of strings to longs or whatever. And there's all kinds of cool ways of doing the type system conversions automatically as well using Java reflection, which is done for you to eliminate the distractions. And so this then goes back to the client. And usually in this world, the client provides what's known as the view. So if you think about model view controller, the model is the data model. The controller is the thing that takes the request from the client and gets the, the model, gets information from the model and returns it back to the client. And then the client represents the view and its purpose in life is to visualize that and display it to users. So that's kind of a quick tour through how things work internally. Again, there's, there's a lot more we could say about each of those pieces, but I'm going to be focusing in this course primarily on using all this stuff, not implementing it. But if you're curious, it's, it's kind of fun to know where to poke around and see how it works under the hood.